This Sunday marks our entry into the season of Advent. Our theme for the next six weeks is Into the World. Over the next several Sundays, we'll be looking at the way Jesus came into the world and how we are called to go into the world. As we enter into the season of Advent, we're encouraged to engage this season as if we have not arrived at the first coming of Jesus, to enter into this season as if we don't know the whole of the story. Yet many of the Advent texts start with the second coming of Jesus, which is kind of curious. If you took the time to read all four texts that were on offer this morning, then maybe you saw what I saw there a pile of contradictions. Four texts that are woven together for this Sunday because of shared themes that emerged, kind of like the church in some ways. These four passages speak over the course of time. They speak to Israel and her days of near doom and coming doom in the words of Isaiah. They are the voice of the exiled children of Israel who are longing for restoration because of destruction that we hear in the Psalms. The voice of Jesus in the book of Mark that is putting people on alert. The promises of being found in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ in the voice of Paul. What about our time? What does it speak to us? Much the same, perhaps. Doom and destruction, exiled peoples, broken times, broken people, broken systems, the hope of the promise of being found in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. What is the message that we choose to focus on? Not much difference between then and now, perhaps. Sometimes I get really discouraged by the lack of movement that I see in the human condition. I can't imagine how that registers in the eyes of God. I hope and trust that God sees beauty in the mess of humanity that cannot be seen by human eyes. I trust in that hope as if my life depends upon it, because it can be incredibly discouraging to take a look around the world and see hope in all of the broken places. I see the continued threat of pumped-up rhetoric of world leaders, one against another, I see the continued upheaval in places in the world where terror reigns, where bodies of the dead are outside and inside churches and mosques around the world. I hear the term blood and soil making a resurgence in our time, a phrase that was used in Nazi Germany as a call for this national body to be connected with a settlement area to rise up and take over to claim what is rightfully theirs. The right people, on the right soil, at the right time. As if any of us own this world, really. I hear of the drug issues that are on the rise in our community, and I recognize the many tragic and traumatic deaths that have been a result of those choices. It is easy for us to turn away from all of those voices and say, We can't see it. It's fine here. It seems like a discouraging time to be speaking of the anticipation of God coming to this world through Jesus, of calling for God to rend open the heavens and come to this earth, of Jesus saying, It is not if I will return to this earth. It is when I will return to this earth. All of this language of barriers breaking between heaven and earth, it could bring fear in the hearts of many. It sounds quite unsettling. Does this idea of God coming into the world this way, of God rending open the heavens and coming down, of Jesus not once coming to the earth, but twice coming to the earth, does that leave us with hope? I hope so. I don't know if any of you remember the title of one of my sermons from last Advent season, Don't Make Me Come Down There. It seems this idea that God might actually come down here is timeless, and it applies today, and it's something that we can still call for. 
Will this call for God, for Jesus to come down here ever get old? I hope not. Before it'll happen in the fullness of time, we may or may not see it. For some, it might be old already, the second coming of Jesus business. These texts of Jesus coming again have a history of being used to help people get right with God. When was the last time you heard that phrase? Is it time to get right with God? I've heard it a couple of times in my lifetime. Maybe that image of God waiting for us to get right with God makes people uncomfortable. Maybe these passages were used at a time to incite fear into people so that they will make sure that they are right with God before something bad happens or before Jesus actually does come again. There is some anxiety that can be wrapped up in these, in these, in these passages. But I don't like the theology of fear to invite people to get into right relationship with God. But there is a caution There is a caution that goes with completely erasing that invitational language to engage with God with our whole beings and to know Jesus on our own and to claim him as our Savior and to be claimed by Jesus. When we erase that out of our vocabulary, then we begin to forget some things. We forget that we are called to be in a good place with God. We forget that we are called to be attentive. We forget that we are called to long for the day when God will speak words of restoration over the earth and to set things right. We forget that we are called to look for Jesus at any and every moment. And we forget that but for the grace of God, We all are nothing. We forget the promises that we hear in the words of Paul to the people at Corinth. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks to my God always for you because of the grace, because of the grace of God that has been given to you in Christ Jesus. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind, just as a testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you, so that you are not lacking any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He will strengthen you to the end, so that you may be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful By him we are called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. These three other passages in the lectionary text for today speak from a place of lack, which is understandable. A place where there is not enough, where dreams have been dashed and reality is lying around like a bad reminder of all that we don't have anymore. Isaiah is speaking to a people who have been set out of their land, out of their life, out of their favor with God. And why did that happen? For they desired more to be like their neighbors, who had a king, than to be the people of God, as they were called to be. The psalmist is speaking for people who were either watching their kingdom crumble or had already crumbled around them. They were calling out to be remembered in their time of loss. They were asking for restoration. But what kind of restoration was this people seeking? A return to the glory days of old? Or were they looking for something new that was about to appear? It's hard to say exactly what the people were asking of God. For we were not inside their mind or their situation or their time period. Their struggles are not our struggles. It would be so easy to say. But are they our struggles today? It is easy to disconnect ourselves from the situation of the people of those times before, saying they are not relevant, they have run their course, they have lived their time If we're really honest, we might not even believe that God would really want to come down here anymore. 
we may not even believe it's possible that God could intervene in our world today. Why? Because somehow we think we don't really need God. We have access to all that we need to make happen what needs to happen. We are independently wealthy by most of the world's standards, even if for some of us it does not feel that way. We have access to medical care when it's needed, only there are many around us who do not. We have running water, we have a sewage system, we have access to so many things, while others, even in our own country, do not have that kind of access. We are in Kansas. We are independent. We are edge of the prairie people with a fierce sense of survival and an independent spirit. We, along with most of the other people around us who subscribe to this fierce American spirit that has driven most of this civilization and has displaced countless people. This kind of thinking does not sound like it meshes with the Sermon on the Mount or the teachings of the upside-down kingdom or the words of Jesus about giving up death for life. We've heard from Clayton and Gordon in their sermons that humans have an inflated sense of self and control. Clayton noted two weeks ago that we as human thinks, we've got this, we got it covered, we can do this. We hear that phrase currently in culture. But really, it is God who has this, not us. Gordon reminded us through his illustration last week that we can try to outdo God at, well, everything. And in the end, we will always meet our end, death. Today, I ask you to consider if we really think and want God to come into our situation. Because, friends, God has already torn open the heavens and has come down. God has already set restoration in process by sending Jesus to this earth. The second coming has not happened, at least not to my knowledge, but the kingdom has come to earth in the person of Jesus the Christ. Jesus called it forth, and he left it in the hands of his disciples, which has puzzled people for ages. And as hard as the disciples tried to get Jesus to designate a leader, he resisted. And instead, he said to them, I am leaving it to you. I am leaving it to all of you, each and every one you all will get the Spirit, and then you will go and you will speak of me in whatever place you find yourself. The passage in Mark that was read for us can read as confusion, as prophecy, as apocalyptic, as far-fetched, as something to be set aside, as something that really won't happen. Timothy Geddert, in his commentary, in the Believer's Commentary series on Mark, offers other ideas to help shape and engage in a conversation with this text from Jesus. He calls forth four things that he sees in this text. Discernment, allegiance to Jesus, faithful discipleship, and faithful mission. This text in Mark is about how to live now in anticipation of what is to come. The living is living, the way to living now is to be a people of discernment, starting with attentiveness to the Spirit, moving, working, calling, that still small voice that we listen for, the one that stirs in the new and unexpected ways, the surprising ways, It means actively engaging with one another, as Anabaptists have done through the centuries, engaging in conversation in a way that is true dialogue with one another, with a willingness to listen to our brothers and sisters, to work out together what it means to be the body of Christ in this time right now. 
The way to living now is to declare our allegiance to Jesus above all else, above money, above family, above nation, above all else, to align ourselves with the way of Christ, to seek the way of Christ in all that we do. It leaves me asking this question, who is your first love? Is your first love truly Jesus? Or is there another idol that stands in the way? I wonder with all of the voices in this world that are vying for our attention through every medium available, how hard is it to seek the voice of Jesus in the midst of all of that noise? The way to living now is through faithful discipleship of one another, with one another, with others who do not know Jesus, for they offer us a fresh perspective on a story that may have grown old for us. How are we engaging with our brothers and sisters who make up this body of Christ with us? Are we walking with one another in ways that engage our spiritual life and our spiritual growth? I hope so. Are we seeking ways to strengthen our own relationship with God, to understand more about Jesus and staying grounded in the ways of Jesus? For that seems of utmost importance. The way to living now is faithful mission, and I would add witness We spend a lot of time on ourselves. It's built into our culture, and I see it becoming built into our churches. What we want, what we think we need, what keeps us in our own zone. When we do this, then we miss out on mission and witness and ministry. We miss the people who are in our paths. We miss the ways to engage with others over the little things in life that make a difference even if it seems small and uncertain. We might miss the ways that we are being called to engage our community that brings about authentic connections. These things come together to declare that Jesus has already come into this world. Discernment, allegiance to Jesus, faithful discipleship, faithful mission and witness. Jesus sent his disciples into the world. Jesus sends us into the world. Right here, right now, no need to wait. The Spirit has come upon us, and the Spirit is moving within us. The kingdom is out there. What are we waiting for?